Good morning. Uh, hi, my name is Scott Hiley. Um, I'm a member of the Communist Party, um, and uh, I'll be talking this morning about the uh, the working class in Marxist theories, with the Marxist theory of the working class. So my uh, presentation is going to focus on really one uh, simple point, um, that the working class can save the world. And I hope that sounds a little bit strange to people. I hope you believe it. I hope, I hope nobody's questioning that, but I hope it sounds a little bit strange because capitalist culture wants that to sound strange, wants that concept to sound um, uh, weird to us. So I did some Google searches about saving the world, right? Um, who, who is thought of as being able to save the world? Um, Mark Zuckerberg, um, big data, blockchain, uh, AI, financial markets, cryptocurrency, Bill Gates, uh, Elon Musk. Uh, there's somebody wrote a book called Elon Musk, A Mission to Save the World, right? So we're inundated with this idea that um, if the world's gonna be saved, it's gonna be saved by, um, by billionaires, visionaries, futurists, you know, whatever you wanna call them. Um, and that uh, drowns out uh, the basic idea of of Marxism, which is that the working class can save the world, or we might say that only the working class can save the world, or if that sounds too narrow, maybe the working class can and must save the world, or the the world will not be saved, will not uh, progress out of its current predicaments without the leadership of the working class. Um, so. I think when most people think of Marxism, they think of that struggle of the working class for its own liberation, right? Um, to overcome capitalism and establish socialism, establish working class power. That's part of it. That's the core, but it's not the whole picture because that struggle of the working class to liberate itself is also the driving force of all other struggles for progress, the struggles, struggle for democracy, for um, sustainability, for peace. Right? These are uh, areas where working class leadership uh, is needed. Um, so that's kind of what we're uh, going to address. We're gonna have kind of four uh, subtopics in there. What is the working class? Why does it have a special role? How is the working class different from the capitalist class? And can we really save the world? So what defines the working class? In Marxism, what makes somebody a member of the working class is that they don't own the means of production, right? They don't own enough stuff to make a living off of their own labor. Um, if you're a physician but don't own a private practice, for example, you don't own the means of production in your field. Um, if you're an auto worker and don't own an auto plant, you don't own the means of production in your field. And therefore, we have to sell our labor power uh, to people who do uh, own the means of production. Those are called capitalists. Um, we receive a wage. Sometimes it's a uh, salary. Uh, they receive the value that we produce. Right? That's the basic thing. So if you sell your labor power to somebody else. If you go to a workplace or a workspace owned by someone else to use equipment or software owned by someone else to create value for someone else, you are a member of the working class. Um, you might be a nurse or a teacher or a custodian or a construction worker. You might be a physician. You might be a software engineer. You might be a bus driver, um, an auto worker, an electrician. It doesn't matter, right? The fundamental definition is whether or not you own the means of production um, or whether you have to sell your labor power in order to stay alive. Um, you might make, in fact, uh, you might make a comfortable income, but chances are you don't, right? Uh, you might um, have relatively good working conditions. Chances are also that you don't, right? Overwork, uh, underpay, um, unsafe conditions, alienation, these are common uh, features of working class life. 
there's also a lot of mystifications uh, surrounding uh, the, that definition of the working class. Um, the working class, we should point out, is not defined by an income level. Right? It's you know some people will say, oh, we're, the working class is people making less than seventy-five thousand dollars a year. No, not true. Um, the working class is not defined by an educational background. You know, one very common definition is, uh, you know, uh, working class people are people without a four-year college degree or working in jobs that don't require a four-year college degree. No, not true, because that excludes, uh, you know, teachers, nurses, um, a lot of engineers. And it excludes huge portions of the working class. Um, it's not defined by a job title. It's not blue collar or white collar. It's not whether you work with your hands or uh, work at a computer, um, because in fact every job is both manual and intellectual. There, that that separation is something that you know we have to rethink. And it's especially not a consumer profile, right? It's not you know if you look at um, popular portrayals of the working class, what do we see? It's often you know pickup trucks, uh, domestic beer, um, certain kinds of, of sports fandoms, whatever. Um, that's that's not it either, right? Um, a Wall Street uh, banker like the Duck Dynasty guy doesn't become a member of the working class just by hopping into a pickup truck and drinking a Bud, a Bud Light. That's right. And so and we should think about why all of these mystifications about the working class are circulating. Why do they gain such currency? Well, uh, it's because the capitalist class has a very strong interest in not letting us recognize who we are as workers and who's with us as workers. Not letting us recognize, in fact, that the vast majority of the people are members of the working class and that we share common experiences of exploitation and oppression. We also we also differ in many ways, right? Um, some sections of the working class face special oppression based on um, their race or nationality or their gender identity. Uh, though, and those are uh, questions that we will be, you know, looking at in a later session. But all members of the working class share common experiences of exploitation. Capitalism, the capitalist class, really does not want us recognizing that. So what is the special role of the working class in capitalism? What, what's the thing they're trying to keep us from understanding? The text on the, the left-hand side there is the end of the first chapter of the Communist Manifesto. It's the famous part about um, uh, the capitalist class creates its own grave diggers, right? It creates the conditions for its own overthrow. This is a really, really important uh, foundational piece of Marxism because it's where uh, Marx first develops the idea of the contradiction at the heart of capitalism and the role of the working class um, in moving society forward. So modern industry as it develops, this is what Marx says, um, brings people together, right? Um, we look at history, how how production has developed, moving from, you know, individuals in or small workshops uh, to bigger factories, and now to vast global supply chains where the the labor of of tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of workers are uh, coordinated. As capitalism develops, as industry develops, we are brought together, right? Um, we're brought together, and especially because it's under capitalism, because uh, there is this common experience of exploitation, we are all brought into similar conditions. Um, we all come to have something in common, whatever our profession is, construction, being a chef or a physician or um, farm worker, uh, cultural worker, whatever. Um, we all come to have something in common. Uh, and as we are brought together, as we come to understand, talk to other workers, understand what we have in common, understand that all of us are being 
uh, attacked, exploited uh, by the capitalist class, something else happens that, that Marx and Engels call revolutionary combination, right? Um, the, the coordination of our labor under capitalism, uh, which is a source of huge profits for capitalism, by the way, becomes a revolutionary combination when we decide to organize ourselves as a class and stand up, right? So um, capitalism requires that coordination of our labor in order to make profits. Uh, the, the source of a, of a ton of, of value is that uh, that ability to bring our labor together. Um, so they can't they can't move backwards on that. They have to keep bringing us together. But at the same time, they don't want us to develop this revolutionary combination. So what do they do? Um, they try to force us into competition, to divide us in every way possible, to divide employed workers against unemployed workers, um, higher wage against lower wage workers, um, the divisions of, of white supremacy, of male supremacy, homophobia and transphobia, um, uh, the you know, uh, native born workers versus foreign uh, workers and immigrant workers. All of these are things that capitalism uses to keep us apart, to keep us from turning that coordination of our labor into revolutionary combination, into coming together on our own behalf as a class um, and, and overthrowing capitalism. That's that's the basic thing. Um, the capitalist class realizes that our that there's a that there's a contradiction there, that their survival depends on both bringing us together and keeping us apart. They know how precarious their position is. Um, they know that it's growing more and more precarious, and that's why, in fact, um, the extreme right is gaining more and more power because the, there is more and more effort being pumped into keeping people divided, into, into uh, using all of these forms of division, right? So the special role of the working class within capitalism is that it, it will end capitalism. The special role of the working class is that um, it will be the grave digger of this divisive, exploitative, brutal system. Um, and in doing so, it will also um, make possible the elimination of all of the garbage that capitalism brings along with it. Um, all of, uh, you know, war, fascism, um, environmental destruction, uh, racism, male supremacy. The, the working class can fight for not just its own liberation, but in doing so, the liberation of uh, of the world as a whole, and that's the special role. So, what makes us different? I'm going to go back to the the one with the revolutionary combination. I like that one best. Um, what makes us different from the capitalist class? Why would working class power be different from capitalist class power? Well, um, I think in a certain sense, it's kind of it's kind of obvious because if you don't believe me that the working class is different from the capitalist class, just look at look at our society or look at history. You know, working class power looks like a picket line. Capitalist class power looks like a police barricade. The working class uh, wants public schools. The capitalist class wants private prisons. Working class struggle gave us weekends and safety uh, rules and unemployment and social security and you know the capitalist class struggle gave us poverty and global warming and fascism right the capitalist class and the working class are different and they're different for a material reason um, the capitalist class capitalists exercise power individually as owners of property uh, the working class doesn't own property we don't hold power as individuals we hold power collectively through our revolutionary combination, right? We understand collectivity because under capitalism, we have been brought into 
uh, collectivity and forced to understand it, forced to develop it as a condition of our own survival. Um, capitalism forced us together and we're learning to turn that into, uh, into power. So in that same way, the capitalist class, we might say, requires inequality. It's un capitalism is unequal and undemocratic at its heart. Uh, there's an inequality between property and labor. Property um, keeps labor in subjugation. Uh, and around that central inequality, capitalism embraces, cultivates, invents, organizes a whole array of other inequalities uh, that we just mentioned to, to prop up its power and secure its profits. The working class, unlike the capitalist class, does not benefit in any way from that inequality. Right? The working class has no material interest in um, one person or one section being set above another. And that's why Lenin will point out, and I think this is a fundamental insight, that um, only the working class can carry the fight for democracy all the way to the end. Right? Only the working class can carry the fight for democracy even beyond capitalism, uh, or can lead rather that fight even beyond capitalism. So that's the challenge, right? For humanity to move forward, we have to learn to work collectively. The capitalist class can't even get itself to work collectively, let alone organize um, all of the, you know, all of humanity into a, a collective project that falls to the working class. We are the ones uh, who understand collectivity. Is that something that we can do? Can we really save the world? Sometimes it looks daunting, right? You know, when a substantial section of our working class uh, falls under the sway of fascist ideology, um, uh, when, you know, the influence of white supremacy and male supremacy are so uh, pervasive uh, when um, the ideological onslaught of, of the ruling class is so constant and so kind of surrounding us at, at every turn, um, it looks very daunting. The idea that the working class can come together as a class, rise up and um, yeah, move the world forward, it's sometimes hard to see. Um, but, you know, I was going to, in in ending this class, talk about an example I like from astronomy about, about, you know, the collision of black holes a billion years ago and how we figured out how to, you know, detect this tiny faint trace, right, of the gravitational waves, the disruption from that that explosion and how that's what we have to do with the working class. We have to see every uh, piece of, you know, collectivity, every little act of solidarity and recognize the potential and build on it. But I don't think that's, you know, what, I, I, I don't think we need to talk about how, how distant and hard to see it is because, you know, I watched a, a video from the UAW the other day called I See Power. It's um, uh, cut together with, you know, a speech from, from Sean Fain, the, the president, uh, along with, you know, scenes from the picket line. Um, and it's an amazing video. Take a look at it because it really shows what working class power looks like, that um, it's uh, multiracial, it's men and women, LGBTQ people, um, straight people, cis people, uh, the, the, the display of unity, of militancy, and of confidence in the ability of the class uh, to create fundamental change uh, is really something. And I think the labor struggles that are happening now all over the place are, um, are not just faint traces or, um, uh, you know, of, of the working class's ability to save the world, but, um, but very clear signs of, of something developing. Uh, so um, we have every reason to, uh, remain to to maintain revolutionary optimism and uh, just to keep working at it. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. We're now uh, 
transferring to our next presenter. Good morning, comrades. My name is Cameron. I'm a trade union activist and a shop steward out of Detroit, Michigan. And today I'm going to be discussing the working class and the struggle for democracy and kind of juxtapose uh, bourgeois concepts of democracy, freedom, and revolution from the founding of the Republic to the Marxist concepts of these terms in the new revolutionary age of scientific socialism and the proletariat, the new revolutionary class. So the origins and the class nature of these concepts in the United States, um, for my purposes, I'm gonna start with the, the class struggle between the old system, feudalism and monarchy and colonialism and the new system being born, which was capitalism and the rising bourgeoisie. I'm also gonna be discussing the limitations of these bourgeois notions of democracy and freedom and revolution and how they've been expanded into our age, scientific socialism and the, the new revolutionary class, the proletariat. So the concept of democracy from the perspective of the bourgeoisie is um, democracy and suffrage and voting was exclusive to propertied men and the elites, right? So the government was formed as a government of the people with a capitalized P, people versus the, the people, right? Which is the workers, women, and enslaved. And in order to secure the bourgeois revolution against the British empire, concessions were made to these people as on behalf of the, what they called the people, uh, the bourgeoisie. However, because of the alliance created between the propertied men and the elites and the lowercase people to secure the bourgeois revolution, it has become a very important vehicle for class struggle with very clear limitations, right? Because we know that the bourgeoisie likes to deflect the struggles of the masses into the political representatives of the property class or the people, capital P. This is a quote um, from Lenin, and I think it's really important to highlight here because what he's saying is that democracy in capitalist society is for uh, an insignificant minority, right? It's a democracy for the rich. But what's important is it's democracy in and of itself is not a negative thing, right? If the working class plays the leading force and the, the main vehicle for struggle for democracy, it'll be objectively progressive in nature. The concept of freedom, um, according to the bourgeoisie, is an absence of restraint, right? It's a freedom as what the government could not do. It was an opposition to power and the exercise of power. And that's very different from how Marxists think of um, the role of the government and the state, right? Because we think of the role of the government and the state as in terms of class and class dynamics. And an example I think of is um, the Soviet Union, right? It, and that was thought of as what the government could do and what it, how it could exercise power and provide for the working class. The concept of freedom for the bourgeoisie was exclusively this, this idea of the freedom of commerce, right? It's the freedom to exploit, the freedom to steal land, the freedom to enslave, and it was thus a laissez-faire type of freedom. And it was purely political as well. The concept of freedom was not really thought of as like an economic thing, right? It was it was mostly confined to, to politics. The freedom to, um, to, I guess, balance the class rule of the owning class, the property class, and the, the people, the, the masses, right? With these uh, checks and balances. The, the idea of equality was a matter of law only. It didn't even extend into like politics, right? But the, the opposite of, equality, inequality was held as proof of the existence of a so-called free government, right? Because the way it was thought of is like, well, capitalism is natural and 
if we have these people with different so-called abilities, which is really how much wealth and property you had and your ability to you know, contribute to the Republic, that the inequality between that was proof that this was a free government, right? And a natural free economy that there would be the fullest play of competition between so-called abilities, which is really your wealth, your privilege, and, and your background. The, the idea of revolution, um, the way we think about it as Marxists, is that it's a social and economic transformation of a new class with enhanced productive capabilities and a social progressiveness wherein the old ruling class and system is replaced, right? And we can think of the Communist Manifesto when Marx and Engels said the, the hetero of all history is the history of class struggle. I'm paraphrasing, but you know, that's, that's the idea, right? There's an antagonism and a contradiction in this class struggle between the, the mode of production um, during the time of the rising bourgeoisie in the American Revolution, it was the mode of production of feudalism to the new system being born capitalism. In our epic, it's the contradiction between capitalism, private ownership, and, and private, private property, wealth producing property and the relations of production. As comrade Scott said before, our, the relations of production under capitalism are very socialized, right? We all work together in large numbers to perform tasks to keep the economy going. It's a very social relationship, whether you work at a school, a meatpacking facility, the assembly line, a grocery store, wherever. We all work together as working class people to fulfill tasks to complete production process. But that's in contradiction because all our time and all our labor and the fruits of our labor go directly to the capitalists, the, the owners of the means of production. In the era of bourgeois democracy, our era, social struggle has become a fact of political and economic life. Thus, a primary institution for the social struggle is the bourgeois democratic system, right? Our job, we want to take it beyond its limits both in the government and the economy. And um, I, I put this quote in here by Frederick Douglass because I really think it's important to understand that, you know, all, all struggles, especially the struggle between the working class and the capitalist class, there'll be contradictions, right? And he talks about their people who want crops without plowing up the ground, or they want the rain without the thunder and lightning, or the ocean without the awful roar of its many waters. And I think it's important to detail here how it's it's not like a, a pure perfect thing that goes from one thing to another. There's a lot of dynamic back and forth, just contradictions resolving, new contradictions forming. But without the struggle, without the working class struggling, there will be no progress. The struggle for a more consistent democracy has been a driving force since the founding of the United States, right? There's been the abolition movements, the radical reconstruction period, which some call one of the first instances of the dictatorship of the proletariat. There's the women's suffrage movements, the, the battles for labor unions and um, the CIO and forming and eventually passing the National Labor Relations Act. There's a civil rights upsurge in the 50s and 60s, the anti-war and peace campaigns in the 60s and 70s. These are just some examples of the, the interplay, the, the, the struggle for um, you know, working class ownership and power of our own daily lives. This is another quote from Lenin that I wanted to add because I think it's really important because he says that whoever wants to re reach socialism by any other path than that of political democracy will inevitably arrive at conclusions that are absurd and reactionary, both in the economic and political sense, right? And this is for us important to understand that our understanding of struggle is a scientific and calculated approach to struggle. It's We don't go around, we don't go outside of things, we don't try to take shortcuts. Our, our view of struggle is, is scientific. The Communist Party's conception of, of democracy is democracy is breaking the chains of slavery, upholding the right to collectively bargain, supporting oppressed people's right to determine their own destiny, right? It's, it's upholding the right of 
self-determination of women's rights, both in the economic sphere, the productive sphere, as well as in the domestic sphere, in the reproductive sphere. It's championing the right to vote. Ours is a consistent working class democracy. And our democracy extends beyond the ballot box, right? Working class democracy is a dynamic everyday force in our workplaces, our neighborhoods, and our institutions. Our consistent working class democracy gives working people the ability to have power and decision making and control over every aspect of our daily lives, what we produce and how we go about our daily lives. We, our democracy gives power and voice to our class. The battles of the day are democratic struggles that have a strong class underpinning, right? Because again, going back to our scientific view of struggle, we view of, of history and historic struggle as class struggle. And the working class must be the leading force in the struggle for democracy. The greater our class puts its imprint on these democratic struggles, the more objectively progressive the shifts in the balance of the, the forces become, right? And we know that without the working class playing the leading role, the, the more like liberal middle, middle elements, middle class, whatever you want to call it, will always under pressure move to the right. So it's really important that our struggles, where we involve ourselves, where our class is in struggle, that it has backbone, determination, and organization. Without working people united and organized and radicalized, around the issues brought to light by the means of the democratic struggle, then we would have no revolutionary movement to build on. And these are some of the democratic and class struggles today. It's, it's just one ex a few examples, it's not an exhaustive list, obviously, but there's some that I think are really important to highlight that are, these are both democratic struggles, but they're also class struggles, right? It's the struggle to have community control of the police to have tenants unions and housing associations and block clubs that offer an alternative force to big landlords and big real estate. It's a struggle to pass the PRO Act and revitalize our unions, one member, one vote, revitalize our unions and bring reform efforts into our unions. It's the struggle for public ownership of major utilities such as electricity and water and major infrastructure like railroads and airports. It's the democratic fight for LGBTQ plus rights, for civil rights, for protecting and expanding reproductive rights and expanding voting rights and civil rights and fighting for affirmative action. It's for ranked choice voting and for environmental movements and struggles against climate change and big fossil fuel firms, monopoly energy firms and militarism. And militarism because we know US imperialism and the US military is the largest con contributor to climate change. The working class must take a leadership role. Again, I'm going to reiterate this a lot, of, a lot, but we have to be the leading force in the struggle for democracy and socialism, because our struggle is for the realization of universal suffrage, the establishment of the popular vote, a complete desegregation of U.S. society, and for equitable school funding, public school funding with unionized public school teachers. We want to end mass incarceration, slave labor, and state-sanctioned police executions. We want universal access to safe abortions and equal pay for equal work, living wages, the right to form or join a union, rent control, gun control, military budget cuts, and redirecting fossil fuel and corporate agricultural su subsidies towards renewable energy and smaller sustainable food producers, right? And as we know, a lot of our agricultural land and farmland is owned by the monopoly capitalist class and something that would bring greater working class democracy to food production would be a land, uh, an attempt at a land redistribution away from these big monopoly landowners to back to farmers and cooperatives to make sustainable food production for our nation and our, and our working class in the world. And these struggles, these democratic struggles with a strong class underpinning are what give the working class valuable organizing experience. When successful, these struggles can show that positive change is possible and can gain confidence in collective action. Indeed, these struggles have the potential to draw our class, our working class, into deeper struggle for socialism. And in fact, without a successful struggle for democracy and for socialism, it's impossible 
to reach socialism without fighting for these democratic demands in the here and now, right? So, so these struggles will not magically give us socialism, but what, what, what they will do is set the stage. They will, they'll give lessons, they'll give optimism, they'll give organization and discipline to our class to then take the, the banner up and fight for, for socialism. But without us lifting up the banner for consistent working class democracy now, socialism is impossible. And thank you comrades for listening to my presentation and I look forward to the rest of the classes. Thank you. Thank you, Cameron. We have one more presentation before we open the floor for discussion. My name is Dee Miles and I work with uh, the working class um, think tank. And I'd like to thank all of the um, presenters who will be sharing the work that they've been doing so far with the working class think tank. Our objective is to grow our ability to explain in plain language um, the nature of our struggle and the challenges that face us. So um, let me begin. What makes us us as the working class of the United States of America? What makes us us as working class USA? How can we invigorate conscious working class struggle to unleash even more of the power of our working class? Our answers rely on the science of social change as developed by Marx, Engels, and Lenin, and as applied to the specifics of the, of the USA through the work of the Communist Party for 105 years. Is there a specter still haunting capitalism in the USA today? The upsurge in working class fight back suggests yes, that a powerful specter is still haunting. As discussed earlier, what makes us us is not how much or little money we make or how high or low status the job we do is, or even how skilled or unskilled we are as workers. All of these factors in the Marxist framework amount to quantitative differences, meaning they are differences of degree, not differences of quality. Marx and Engels clearly defined that what makes us us as the working class is this. We have no other way to live but to put up for sale our ability to work, our ability to labor. We have no form of wealth producing property. In other words, we, we own no private property. But in this regard, we have to be careful because everybody who works is not necessarily of the working class, even though they look like us. It's not working that makes you working class. Many small business owners work. It's that members of the working class have no other way to provide a life for ourselves or our families without selling our ability to labor. This is what forces us to perpetually be what Marx called wage slaves. The dominant ruling class culture tries to entrap us in shame and guilt. And our challenge is always to find the wherewithal to stand up and a prideful glory of our very being. What is it about us as the working class for which we can be proud? We do the work in producing the goods and services that keep this country running day by day. And we as the working class do not live off 
the exploitation of others. The only means we have available to us to live is by selling our ability to labor. We can make a conscious choice to be proud of who we are. Actually, it's a choice of re resistance. To be proud of who we are, even though the dominant culture says we should be ashamed of, of, be, of not being owners of wealth producing property and the privileges therefore afforded. As a side note, we can even argue that we, working class USA, do not, do not really benefit from US imperialism's exploitation of the resources and peoples of the global South or anywhere else, else in the world, even though it's argued widely that we do. The intensive exploitation we experience in the belly of this beast is so great, it is reasonable to argue that none of the wealth from US imperialism's world plunder puts even a morsel of food on our tables. They hoard it all for themselves. We don't have to devolve into a vicious battle over different opinions concerning this matter. We can continue to examine and explore. Our goal is to remove, challenge, and resist all tendencies toward taking on the burden of responsibility for what US capitalism did in the past or does now even though we are fully responsible for doing everything we can to end as soon as possible the ability of US imperialism to continue to continue to plunder, terrorize and destroy the planet. That's an empowering responsibility, not a defensive weakening one. What is fundamental that we all have in common as the working class? All of us experience exploitation because we sell our ability to labor to live, even though the degree of exploitation varies. Most of us find there is too much month at the end of the money. All of us as members of the US working class are poor. Even if all of us made $200,000 a year, which very few of us actually do, relative to the ruling capitalist class, we would still all be paupers. The idea of being so labeled as poor might cause discomfort for most. But how else do we get to the reality that relative to the wealth of the ruling capitalist class, we are all poor and therefore we have a common interest with those who are the most poor segment of our class, who experience the severest degree of being poor which is poverty. All of us are not impoverished, but we have an objective common interest with the impoverished segment of our class. Marx exposed in Capital that being a wage slave is the decisive factor. And he warned we should not fall prey to the disunifying influence of differences in income. In reality, who are those who live in poverty today? We all know there is a high percentage of Black, Latino, and Indigenous people who are impoverished. But there is also a very high percentage of single mothers with their children. I find it difficult to put my finger on the data to prove it, but the majority, meaning the largest number, 
of those in poverty today are possibly white single mothers with their children. We know they are a significant portion of the impoverished, but math logic suggests white single mothers and their children number in the majority among the impoverished. If this is in fact true, U.S. imperialism has significant reason to want to keep this hidden because if, if it, because it fundamentally challenges the ruling class characterization of what being white means in terms of white supremacy. We will do more to explore this matter in the future. All of us in the US working class experience exploitation as a result. And as a result, we also experience oppression. It behooves us to make the difference, the differences in degree of exploitation and type of, of oppression a matter of conscious understanding. The differences produce extra exploitation, which result in extra profit for the ruling capitalist class. The, differ the difference of type relative to oppression opens up opportunities for the working class and we have to be able to understand to understand how it works lenin explained it plainly the history of working class exploitation has an added phenomena at it at its side that phenomena is racial nas national and gender oppression Racial, national, and gender oppression are not based exclusively on exploitation. Some who suffer racial, national, and or gender oppression may experience exploitation because they are also members of the working class, but all are not members of the working class. Lenin says the working class has potential allies in non-working class forces who are the victims of racial and national and or gender oppression because their oppression stems from social domination perpetuated by the ruling class as an integral part of their ideology and culture. Because they are the ruling class their ideology and culture are dominant. We have the potential to win many of these forces to the side of the working class, some only temporary, but others will join in for the long haul because they join the struggle for real freedom and real democracy instead of being satisfied with the privilege of owning private property, small capital for the most part. This does not mean that any owners of private property are the same as the working class, but it does mean some will abandon their non-working class class origins and align permanently with the working class. Others will just be temporary allies. We have to be careful because small capitalist forces have the tendency of thinking their role is to be the leaders of the working class. We cannot afford to be confused about this. The working class has to lead the working class movement. We are discussing what are called special questions about which more will be said next Sunday morning. Class inequality is based on exploitation. If you have any form of exploitation, you will also find oppression. Though all exploitation carries with it oppression, meaning social domination, 
All oppression does not require exploitation. Inequality in our society can be a product of exploitation, but it can also be a product of oppression without exploitation. As an example, Black capitalists experience the social oppression of white supremacy and racism, and they will, even if momentarily, join the fight against white supremacy and racism, especially as it affects them and their access to capital. Many of their representatives spoke militantly at the August 26th, 60th anniversary March on Washington because the threat on affirmative action threatens their access to capital through minority set-asides. The ills of capitalism hide behind the ideological smokescreen perpetuated by the ruling capitalist class. If people are poor, then it's the fault of the individual, then it's the fault of individual or group inferiority. But Marx and Engels placed in bold relief the ills of capitalism inherent to its very nature. Capitalism by its very nature promotes division within the working class. Based on competition for jobs, high versus low wage workers and employed versus unemployed workers. In the USA, these factors are masked by race and gender, but it's not difference based on race and gender that are the source of disunity. Race and gender become shields behind which the inherent ills of disunity caused by capitalism itself can hide. In addition to exploitation, all members of the working class experience insecurity, social and political domination, and the reality of being unequal to those who own private property, be it small or large capital. Race and gender are not the cause of working class disunity. Race and gender become the veils behind which capitalism's perpetuated disunity can hide. Ruling capitalist class ideology explains unemployment existing not because of the in inherent ills of capitalism, but because of the inherent inferiorities of certain groups of people, be they people of color or women or the LGBTQ or the differently abled or the young or the old. The ruling capitalist class argues inequality is not the product of the in inherent ills of capitalism, but the inherent inferiority of people. And if you are white and suffering the ills of capitalism, the capitalist ruling class explains that it is because you are intellectually inferior as an individual. This comes from our ruling capitalist class in defense of capitalism. Working class struggle challenges us to resist internalizing and blaming ourselves for what in fact is the very nature of capitalism itself. This is a problem for us, this is a problem for all of us, including the white segment of our class, of our working class. The US working class is not responsible for how human history in general or the specific history of this country evolved. We as the working class control very little even though the ruling capitalist class has found multiple ways to turn us on ourselves and against our own interests. 
we answer the question, what makes us us as the working class based on a fundamental principle expressed clearly in the manifesto? Quote, in proportion as the bourgeoisie, i.e. capital is developed, the modern working class developed, a class of laborers who live only as long as they find work and who find work only as long as their labor increases capital, end of quote. Quote, the bourgeoisie has stripped of its halo every occupation hitherto honored and looked up, and looked up to with reverent awe. It has converted the physician, the lawyer, the priest, the poet, the man of science into its paid wage laborers, end of quote. Marx and Engels indicate that struggle is an inherent activity of the working class. Class struggle grows out of the very conditions of existence of the working class in confrontation with the ills of capitalism, including exploitation, oppression, insecurity, alienation, etc. The nature of working class struggle evolves as the working class grows. Marx and Engels expose that unity within the working class is challenged by the reality that the inherent nature of capitalism promotes competition within the working class itself. Profoundly uncovered is the role of combination and association, what we know of today as unionization. Struggle requires that the working class combine to combat the competition within the class instigated by the very nature of capitalism itself. The point is that disunity within the working class is not simply a product of racial, national, and gender difference, but disunity in the class is contributed to by the influence of capitalist class racism and white supremacy, sexism and misogyny, homophobia, et cetera. The reality of life under capitalism forces the working class to engage in collective struggle. If we don't, greater and greater hardship will befall us, not simply because capital seeks higher and higher rates of profit by its very nature, but also because more and more powerful forces of production are continuously being developed and introduced into the process of production. New forces of production, meaning the tools, the technology, human skill, energy resources, uh, and other means required for the process of production can make workers obsolete leading to massive layoffs and unemployment. An aspect of the UAW struggle involves the threat of this very issue. Unemployment means we cannot eat or feed our families unless there is a safety net. The quality of the safety net can raise in Marxist uh, theory, the quality of the safety net can raise the value of labor power if the safety net provides for a high standard of living or depress the value of labor power if a low standard of living for the unemployed and the poor sections of our class is the norm. This is one of the reasons why the whole class has an interest in ensuring the safety net for low wage and unemployed workers provides for a standard of living befitting a human being. 
We have to assist our whole class in understanding and being conscious of this connected reality. Quote, the ruling ideas of each age have ever been the ideas of its ruling class, end of quote. The ruling ideas in our context include, for example, white supremacy, male supremacy, war and militarism, and, and anti-Marxist, anti-socialist, anti-communism. How can we better tackle the influence of these ideas on us as the dominated, oppressed, and exploited class in our society? How can we break free of our class having any sense of responsibility for what is the organized perpetuation of ruling class crimes? How can we elevate the exposure of the historic and contemporary role of the ruling capitalist class as the producers, reproducers, and organized perpetu perpetuators of the ideas and material benefits of white supremacy, male supremacy, war militarism, and anti-Marxist, anti-socialist, anti-communism? How can we intensify the struggle against these backward ruling class ideas while reducing their ability to cause disunity among us as the working class. Quote, the first step in the revolution by the working class is to raise the proletariat to the position of ruling class to win the battle of democracy, end of quote. To win the battle of democracy is the historic task of the working class. And Marx places in bold relief that real democracy requires the elimination of the foundational inequality of capitalism. To fully end, any, to fully end inequality, we must end the rights of bourgeois private property in the first place. It's in this context that Bill of Rights socialism becomes a meaningful concept. Lenin indicates, as said earlier, there is no other class that has as much of an in interest in the realization of real democracy, of winning the battle for real democracy than the working class. By extension, no other class in our society has a greater interest in the defeat of male supremacy, white supremacy, war militarism, and anti-communism than the U.S. working class, even if not fully conscious of that reality. As Marx and Engels indicate, we have a world to win and have nothing to lose but our, but, but our chains. I'll, I'll stop there, thank you. And we'll now open the floor for discussion. And I suggest that we take all comments and questions and then um, at the end, we'll turn it back over to our panelists for um, a few minutes of summary comments. Michael, go on, Mike. Comrades, I, I must say, um, Scott and Cameron and the other comrade did a very good job, but I have to say, uh, D, the graphics that you have captured are a message in themselves. So we're hearing words, right? very good simple plain edifying communication but the graphics you employed also tell a story which in effect d i have to say uh amplify the the message and the communication by our speakers so 
this is extraordinary to me and anybody that sees this uh, i don't see how they can't be changed um all power to the education collective thank you d thank you uh uh i have no credit they were actually collected by eric so thank you eric looking for more hands nathan um i wanted to ask about the last presentation um one of the presenters made a comment about the relationship between u.s imperialism and the u.s working class or like the wherein the working class gets none of the benefits of imperialism. Is that the correct position? Or could you please elaborate more on that? OK, thank you, Nathan. Looking for more raised hands. Norman, opening your mic. Thanks, uh, Dee. Thanks a lot. This was really an excellent presentation. I have three, one question and uh, two quick question comments. Uh, the question, the American people have been taught, beginning with the 1920s, uh, that uh, they are all part of this enormous middle class. Uh, that's a central part of uh, capitalist ideology in this country, going back a long time. Uh, if you belong to a middle class, then you're in the middle. There are people below you, people above you. How? And both parties and mass media saturate the society with this concept. Uh, how do we, as Marxists and communists, put forward uh, our view of the working class as the as the dominant as the uh, representing the majority of the people? That's point one. Point two. Uh, uh, in response to the presentations, the presentations were very, very good, very positive. But uh, it is important for us to emphasize the role of the Communist Party, our party, historically, in the victories that uh, the working class has won. It was our party which led the struggle for unemployment insurance, for social security, uh, for the National Labor Relations Act, uh, for minimum wages, et cetera, et cetera. And also in response to Dee's point about, uh, good point, about the huge number of children uh, and women uh, taking care of children living in poverty and uh, the majority being white women. And that's very true. Uh, to a great extent, that is a result of the repeal of uh, the Aid to Families uh, with Dependent uh, Children Act of 1935, which was part of the struggle that our party was involved in leading at the time. And that was repealed uh, by, the, by Gingrich and with the support of Bill Clinton in the mid-1990s. Last very quick, quick point, uh, besides looking at the work of Marx, Engels, and Lenin, uh, we should also, because it is valuable, very valuable, begin to look at uh, the writings of Mao Zedong, particularly, and I don't speak as a Maoist, I'm not a quote Maoist, uh, but uh, particularly his on contradictions, how we deal with internal conflicts in our own ranks, his concept of new democracy, and his emphasis, his emphasis on a very specific, practical uh, uh, delineation of what the masses of people are in the United States, their relationship to the forces of production, where they are in terms of region, where they are in terms of ethnicity, gender, et cetera, et cetera and how we can create unity among them. Okay, thank you very much. It was a fine presentation. Thank you, Norman. Right now we're going to go, Roberta, there you are. Um, I was um, taken with the um, idea of what a huge challenge it is for our working class uh, to deal with the, its responsibility to deal with racism, male supremacy, 
and homophobia. And it's usually presented to us as kind of a negative, a troubling duty that we have to do. And the idea that uh, Dee presented, that this is an empowering responsibility, I think puts a whole new light on it and uh, on working class pride. So I wondered if you could take a minute and expand on that idea of the, the responsibility to take these things on as empowering and not debilitating as it's often seen. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you. We'll take one more. I'm going to go back to Peggy. Well, uh, picking up on the uh, the the way to the affirmation that that uh, the previous speaker uh, Roberta just mentioned, um, you know, I, here's the the question I had posed. I'm just going to read it. The rulers have the legal right, the sanctity of private property. Um, so capital. It, it's not capital per se, it's the private property of capital. Uh, capital is surplus value. And when we recognize surplus value is really the difference between the necessary labor added and the necessary labor consumed in order to reproduce the labor power that added the labor. So the surplus value is really the commonwealth created by all of us, um, and it gets expropriated, it gets privatized, it gets pocketed by individuals and sanctified under the current rules as private property. But it's, it's conceivable as we enter socialism um, to, un to think of that capital as being belong as the genuinely the commonwealth and control democratically anyway i i it, it, it's i guess i'm i'm posing it as a question of uh is it is it conceivable at this point in history in the u.s to to speak that way okay thank you so let's turn thank you for your comments and your questions um we will uh, turn the mic back, back over to uh, uh, Scott, then um, Cameron uh, for two minutes or so to respond to uh, any question or comment that caught your fancy. Scott? Hi, thank you. Um, and uh, all of the, the questions and comments were great, but um, I wanna specifically talk uh, or speak to Norman's uh, point about the the importance of um, emphasizing the role of the party, um, because it's very true. Our party did play a, a leading role in uh, all of those uh, fights that, that demonstrate the, you know, the, the power of the working class and, and lifted up uh, the entire class. Um, but in a certain sense, I think we should point out that our, our party is a party of the working class. We're not we're not separate from it. Right. Um, when I think of revolutionary combination, it's trade unions, of course, but it's also um, the party. We're, we're another tool that the working class has developed in its struggle for unity and its struggle for uh, empowerment and liberation. Um, so, yeah, I, I agree. Uh, the, the role of the party is, is fundamental, um, uh, but it is the, the action of the party is also um, an action of uh, of the working class in some sense. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Scott. And thank you for the work uh, and participating in the project. Cameron? Yeah, um, thank you, comrades, and thank you for the comments and questions. I'd like to take a shot at the first question that was asked about um, American working class benefiting from U.S. imperialism. And, you know, I I'm not an economist, but what I can speak to is on the shop floor uh, as a union steward. And in my shop, the majority of my fellow workers are African American and women. And even like besides that, the majority of us at the shop floor, we live paycheck to paycheck. And we did a survey in our union, and about 78% of us are food insecure. Yet, the amount of profits that our company that we work for brings in 
is so enormous that it it almost doesn't even make sense why we're being i mean it makes sense as from a marxist perspective why we're exploited so heavy but it doesn't it i guess what i'm trying to say is if we do get spoils from us imperialism i guess on the shop floor i'm not really seeing it maybe we can buy like cheap cheaper commodities but in terms of quality of life and ownership and power i i'm just not seeing that and thank you Thank you, Cameron, and thank you for participating in the in the project and and following through. Thank you, thank you. Um, there are many uh, questions that face our working class that we need to explore uh, continuously to strengthen our ability to deal with the challenge challenges. And I would say um, uh, the the concept of the middle class. What's really confusing is that Marx also uses the term middle class, but he's not talking about what's being referred to, to today. Marx is referring to the emergence during the feudal uh, setting, the, the ruling classes uh, during feudalism, the, the uh, land owners and the clergy and uh, whatever, and the arist uh, aristocracy. He's referring to the emergence of the, the uh, uh, bourgeois class as a middle uh, force uh, um, emerging uh, out of the old and establishing itself um, from a position of weakness to a, a position of complete domination. Um, when the term middle class is used today, uh, it is purposefully used to uh, segregate or segment off a section of the working class, the higher paid, the high, uh, better educated, to section off this section of the working class, which in effect puts them in, in position to be completely dominated by small capital. So it, it is very much in our interest to fight tooth and nail for all of the members of our working class to understand why their membership in the working class is true and why uh, growing our uh, understanding of the, of the different segments of our class and our relationship to all segments of our class, um, uh, why uh, that is uh, important. So on the, lastly, on the issue of, of, uh, of uh, racism and male supremacy, the ruling class has done, the ruling capitalist class has done an excellent job in trying to convey a shared interest in racism and white supremacy with all of uh, those who are white, no matter uh, class affiliation, uh, in shared male supremacy among all men, no matter class affiliation, uh, uh, and the extent to which we buy in to that construct is, to, is the extent to which we, we strengthen their hand and empower them even more. So even though it is a challenge, it is objectively true. Though we are subjectively uh, embroiled by the influence it is objectively true. We are not the perpetuators, the originators, or the uh, or the uh, uh, proponents in the uh, 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 of those uh, ideas. The perpet the the perpetuators, the uh, 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 originators 
the promoters of those ideas come from the dominant uh, capitalist ruling class. And as a result of their dominant influence in the society, the influence can hold, uh, can have sway. But it's in our interest to do everything we can to share the influence and put the blame where the blame actually lies. The blame does not lie with us as the working class. The blame lies completely on them. Even if members of the working class raise their hand in defense of the ruling class, they are the peons. The ruling class, the capitalist ruling class, uh, actually uh, bear, in my opinion, full responsibility. But we have more work to do um, because it's a continuous uh, effort, a continuous struggle to explore these topics in a way that enable, uh, that uh, will result in the strengthening our uh, ability to speak lucidly about these topics. So we have another class uh, in 30 minutes, and that class promises to be uh, extremely um, interesting. We will explore, uh, uh, do a deeper dive in uh, taking a look at uh, the specifics of the U.S. working, of different uh, features of the U.S. working class uh, today. So thank you uh, for your participation. You, we, we encourage you to uh, stay and participate uh, in 30 minutes in the next class, but we uh, now have to close th this class so that we can set up for the next. Again, thank you, Scott. Thank you, Cameron. Thank you, Eric. And thank, uh, as uh, participants in pulling this class together, um, and uh, thank you all for taking out uh, time on your Saturday morning to join in. We hope you'll stay for the next class, which will begin at uh, 1 o'clock Eastern. So thank you very much.